So today we're going to read a book called Casey Back at Bat by Dan Gutman. But this book is a continuation or a follow-up of the poem that was written, oh, close to 100 years ago by Ernest Lawrence Thayer, and it's called Casey at the Bat. So we are going to read Casey at the Bat first, and then we will read our book. Now, in Casey at the Bat, I want you to listen for all the rhyming words. There's a lot of rhyming words. If you look at the end of each sentence, there's a rhyming word. Day, play, same, game, rest, rest. So listen and see if you can catch all the rhyming words. All right, you ready? Casey at the Bat by Ernest Lawrence Thayer. The outlook wasn't brilliant for Mudville nine that day. The score stood out four to two with but one any more to play. And then when Cooney died at first and Barrows did the same, a sickly silence fell on the patrons of the game. The straggling few got up to go in deep despair. The rest clung to the hope which springs eternal in the human breast. They thought if only Casey could but get a whack at that, they'd put up even money now with Casey at the bat. But Flynn preceded Casey, as also Jimmy Blake, and the former was a Lulu and the latter was a cake. So upon the stricken multitude, grim melancholy sat, for there seemed but little chance of Casey getting to the bat. But Flynn let drive a single to the wonderment of all, and Blake, though much despised, tore the cover off the ball. And when the dust had lifted and the men saw what had occurred, there was Jimmy safe at second and Flynn a hugging third. Then from five thousand throats and more there rose a lusty yell. It rumbled through the valley, it rattled in the dell, it knocked upon the mountain and recoiled upon the flat. For Casey, mighty Casey, was advancing to the bat. There was ease in Casey's manner as he stepped into his place. There was prize in Casey's bearing and a smile on Casey's face. And when responding to the chairs, he lightly doffed his hat. No stranger in the crowd could doubt was Casey at the bat. Ten thousand eyes were on him as he rubbed his hands with dirt. Five thousand tongues applauded when he wiped them on his shirt. Then while, with, then while the writhing, writhing <laughs> pitcher ground the ball into his hip, defiance gleamed in Casey's eye. A sneer curled Casey's lip. And now the leather-covered sphere came hurling through the air, and Casey stood a-watching it in haughty grandeur there. Close by the sturdy batsman, the ball unheeded speed sped. That ain't my style, said Casey. Strike one, the umpire said. From the benches black with people, there went up a muffled roar, like the beating of the storm waves on a stern and distant shore. Kill him! Kill the empire! shouted someone in the stand, and it's likely they'd have killed him had not Casey raised his hand. And with a smile of Christian charity, great Casey's visage shone. He stilled the rising tumult. He bade the game go on. He signaled to the pitcher, and once more the spirit flew, but Casey still ignored it, ignored it, and the umpire said, strike two. Fraud, cried the maddening thousands, and Echo answered, fraud, but one scornful look from Casey in the audience was odd. They saw his face grow stern and cold. They saw his muscles strain, and they knew that Casey wouldn't let that ball go by again. The sneer is gone from Casey's lip. His teeth are clenched in hate. He pounds with cruel violence his bat upon the plate. And now the pitcher holds the ball, and now he lets it go. And now the air is shattered by the force of Casey's blow. Oh, somewhere in this favored land, the sun is shining bright. The band is playing somewhere, and somewhere hearts are light. And somewhere men are laughing, and somewhere children shout. 
but there is no joy in Mudville. Mighty Casey has struck out. So that is where the poem leaves us, that Casey struck out. So now we have this book called Casey Back at Bat. So let's see what happens now. Casey Back at Bat by Dan Gutman. I'm sure you've heard of Casey, the baseball world sensation, whose famous strikeout lost a game and stunned a hopeful nation. Well, if you think that tale is sad, sit down. Let's have a chat, and I'll tell you all a story I call Casey Back at Bat. "'Twas the last game of the season with Mudville tied for first. The players fought all summer for a pennant they did thirst. But Rutland shared the lead as well. The team stood face to face. To the victor, fame and fortune. To the loser, second place. With Mudville down three runs to one, it was the final inning. Two men were on, but two were out. There seemed no hope of winning. Yet they would not surrender. Their motto, never quit. Mighty Casey grabbed his bat. It was his turn to hit. His arms, his legs, his neck, his teeth, his all had muscle too. They rippled from his little toe up to his eyes of blue. He sneered, he snarled at Mudville's foes, then threw the fans a smirk. Some ladies found him handsome. Some thought he was a jerk. The pitcher hurled his fastball, a perfect strike, and then a fan yelled out, Hey, Casey, are you gonna whiff again? The rumor runners took their places. Once more the pitcher threw. He nipped the outside corner. The ump cried, Strike two! Again the pitcher gripped the ball and gave a forceful fling. Casey brought his back back and decided he would swing. He swung so hard it sliced the air, it echoed, then it cracked. When much to everyone's surprise, the ball, our hero, whacked. That shot might go 500 feet, one bleacher creature reckoned. I showed him, cackled Casey as he rounded first and second. The Mudville fans began to cheer a roar that started growing as they watched the ball go over the wall, and then it kept on going. It soared by hills and valleys, ever higher up in the sky, past houses, farms, and villages. So swift did it fly, it crossed the great Atlantic where it almost struck a bird. But Casey didn't have a clue, for he was rounding third. In, in Italy, an artist thought he'd made his masterpiece, a painting of a tower with some flowers and some geese. He had to start all over when the baseball changed, changed the scene, and this, you see, shows perfectly why leaning towers lean. In Egypt, three small children were engaged in some hijinks when a baseball zipping past them knocked the nose right off the sphinx. It ricocheted to where they played and almost hit those kids, but it instead it zoomed right past them and straight up the pyramids. In India, two rhinos who were lolling in a pond looked up and saw a baseball flying across the great beyond. They ate their lunch and snorted, taking time to smack their lips. 
they hardly seem to notice up until the great eclipse. It flew so fast it raced through time some 60 million years to when a T-Rex and a Stegosaurus roamed the hemisphere. The creatures were quite terrified, so underground they slinked. And now you know how dinosaurs, in fact, became extinct. In the depths of outer space, an astronaut named Janet shrieked, Eureka, I have found it. I've discovered a new planet. Her partner turned to take a look and told her, Janet, in your dreams, I've yet to see a planet sewn together at the seams. Meanwhile, back in Mudville, total strangers hugged and kissed. Casey crossed the plate and told reporters, it's all in the wrist. He hadn't been this happy since the moment of his birth, but from the upper atmosphere, the ball returned to Earth. Now Dunn, the center fielder, had already left the ground and left and white and left and right were chatting on the mound. But Mo, the little shortstop, saw a streak come from above. He raised his arm in self defense. The ball plopped in his glove. Oh, somewhere in this crazy world, some kids are having fun. Some are telling knock-knock jokes. Some skateboard in the sun. And some where kids eat hot dogs piled up high with sauerkraut. But there's still no joy in Mudville. Hard luck Casey has flied out. The end.